Hello and welcome again to the Wisdom Factory with conversations that matter, but actually also African dialogues. I'm here today with Haneli Venucha, and she lives in South Africa. And I know her for some time. We were in conversation groups. And since I went to the Integral African Conference last year in June, I'm getting so much interested in life in Africa, in a different continent, which was so foreign for me, you know, being in Europe and in Italy for a long time and before in Germany. It's just a different way of not only of life, but I realized also of thinking and of approaching the world all together. So I'm happy to invite people to talk about their experience and their life and their work also in Africa. And I have a whole series which is called The Integral African Dialogues. You can find them on thewisdomfactory.net. So now to you, Haneli. I would like you to uh, introduce yourself, talk, tell us a little bit about you, and then we dive into the African part of it. <laughs> Yeah, it, thank you so much um, for this wonderful opportunity. And I always enjoy um, explorations with you that we had online before in other contexts. My name is Anneli. And yes, life in Africa is very interesting. Um, my own journey would, I would keep you busy for like five hours. Um, because I worked all over Africa, I was very fortunate, but also to work in other countries like in Europe and in Turkey and in the US. Um, so I was able to work on four continents during my professional life, which was very useful then to bring it back into context with living in Africa. And in my discoveries, um, I was first a business consultant, a management consultant for one of the big five consulting houses in the world. And that gave me the opportunity then to travel and work all over Africa as well. And what was interesting was in relation to what we are speaking about, um, because I was responsible for development in Africa, we had development solutions. And so Africa was my territory at that time. Now I'm talking about almost two decades ago. But that gave me the opportunity to really understand the rest of life in Africa, not only in the southern point. And for us, sometimes if you think back, it, it's like two different continents like living in two different continents altogether, because like you said, the way of thinking, um, the way we do things. And I was fortunate because I was always able to be very creative in whatever I was doing. So then it was easy to navigate all these differences. And it was very interesting when I worked in Africa, how people there engaged with me. And it was very interesting because they treated me differently from their own people. And I was always fascinated by that. And I would ask, especially politicians, I would ask them, but why are you treating me differently from your own people? I didn't understand that. And then they said something interesting. They said, because I'm not challenging them. So I'm, there's flow. So when we sit together, we explore what's going on in their countries. And what might help them? What do they really need at that moment in time? And so we were working together. So the collaboration thing already then was very strong. So for them, that was a difference between their own people because some of them were still trying to come up, to be seen, to be heard. And that caused dissonance. Mm -hmm. They couldn't really see each other and hear each other of what's really being shared. So there was always the struggle this internal struggle. And that was fascinating. It was really fascinating. And you to navigate talking, that. You are talking about the political life that people try to... to no, no, not only political life, in normal life, in, in businesses, in organizations, uh -huh. entrepreneurs, women. And I worked for a long time with women, uh, women empowerment in African countries as well, after my corporate consulting days. And the same thing happened. And I would ask the ladies that a lot of them were professionals. Um, how, why is this thing there of this continuous um, like disconnect? And I understand from where they're coming from because they had to fight so long to be seen and to be 
really uh, noticed for their value, and they still do. So there was this fighting spirit inside of them. Now, me coming from South Africa, I, I didn't have that fighting spirit because I didn't need it, not as much as they did. Okay. So can we, when we are uh, talking about integral, would that be that they have entered into the red stage of development in spiral dynamics, that they have to fight for... for the, yeah, they between, they between, yeah, between blue and red. Yeah, and they have left the, the purple where thing, people stay together. And then talking with you, you are on a different level, so they can leave the red and, uh, and blue um, com competition. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah, and it's, it was like, if I have to sense into it now, many, many years later, and still having a lot of connection with people there, they felt safe. <sighs> I think that's what they felt. So it's from, if you look in terms of spiral dynamics, my perception of it now, if I'm looking back, is that the different levels in spiral dynamics, so the higher you're up in the levels, not that one is better than the other, they're just different, is that there's a safety and security aspect to it. But a very interesting happened with me in 2010, relating to spiral dynamics. Um, we were at, I was studying spiral dynamics in the US at that time in Los Angeles, and we had to do, we had to look at where we come from. And um, a lot of people were very verbal about Africa. But then we had to come back. When we came back, we had to do it like a case study of, of the, from some organizations that we dealt with. What are they in terms of spiral dynamics, their leadership? And it was fascinating. Some of the most um, innovative technology companies, their leadership were all in purple. <laughs> it was fascinating. And then to notice, because I was deeply involved at that time with them, I was consulting to them and to understand why they make the decisions they make, why they treat their staff the way they do, why they have that internal dynamics in teams that they experienced at the time. So it all became evident that they were all still in purple and they didn't have any of the other layers in their leadership team. So they had huge opportunities, which they embraced, but they couldn't take it further. Mm -hmm. So the, the atmosphere in these enterprises would be more collaborative, more respectful. No, I, I talked with René de Beer and she talked about how she loves the purple spirit, especially <laughs> also in enterprises. And uh, it would be good to do, how do you say, uh, conserve that when people go ahead in, in other levels of development, because then you wouldn't fight all the time, but you would be together it's and together. respect uh, each other. Is that your, your experience? No, in my experience, it's the prob the, not the problem, the dilemma. And I love that, that Dr. Lorraine used to say, there's no such thing as that P word. And I completely agree with that. It's <laughs> dilemmas. <laughs> so the dilemma is that in your organization, you have people on other levels. Yeah. So if the leadership team is in purple or, or caught up in red and blue, you have serious dilemmas in people working together because they can't just see eye to eye. And if there is no vision in the organization, they get stuck, you know, they live in the past. And that's a big problem from exploring South Africa, for example, is, and I'm saying this with a lot of love and respect of everybody involved, is that I am South Africa, I'm born from the soil, and I love the country, I love Africa, period. I love the rest of the world too, but there's something else here. But Sadly, we are, we are still stuck in the past. So if you, if you don't have any leadership in your leadership teams, people with higher up in the spiral, you are, your country's in trouble because you're continuously looking back. And we used to speak about it in, and try to give people experiences, especially leaders, that they can feel it in their bodies, how different it feels. So from an embodiment point of view, that our feet face forward, not backwards. And if you continue to hang on to a struggle that's no longer there, you cannot move forward either. 
And sadly, most of our politicians and leaders are still looking back. And they, so, they, so you go actually back down the spiral instead of four. You're getting all the opportunities to go forward, but you, you are stuck in this looking back part. Do you have any example which you can demonstrate or, or explain a little what you mean? Where do they go back instead of ahead? Now, let me explain. Like I said, I have a lot of respect for what happened in our country and understanding the different experiences of people that went through apartheid, for example, and has been, um, been impacted by that heavily on many, many levels. And I also felt the dignity has been taken away from so many people. So you have to, lead, you have to heal the fabric of society first before you're even thinking of doing something different. But to give you an example of looking back is there was the struggle. It was real. And it happened. So nobody denies that. But people now, 25 years later, after Madiba passed, still holds on to the struggle because it gave them purpose. Ah, yeah. So you, they, you give them opportunities, you give them skills, but you don't heal the real wound, which is the dignity part of my human beingness. And then you could, so you're still hanging on to the struggle because at that time, that gave you purpose. That keep you breathing and, and being alive and, and moving on and trying more harder to be to get this situation solved. Yeah, that reminds me, reminds me a little bit on personal uh, development, you know, when you were not respected as a child, as, a, as, a, as you, but you had to perform for the, for the parents or something, you always will feel that you are not whole. And to, to get back this uh, feeling of, of, of meanness and that I am good, and the way I am, and that I deserve respect, it's in the personal life the, the same struggle which needs to be healed. And you are talking about the whole culture, no? That's, uh, yeah. It's, it's the consciousness, it's the collective consciousness, yeah. Yeah. Is, 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 is that. And uh, to explain easily, I always just mention this perhaps as an example, that we, what we've given people is the what and the how the opportunities and how to do it, the skills. Mm -hmm. But who's missing in this picture and why? The who and the why, the individual, yeah, me. I'm not good enough. Yeah. I was not seen as a human being. And that's terrible. It's incredibly yeah. terrible. So yeah. that must be worked on first before you even give opportunities and, um, and skills because this comes from inside and it will always hold you back. So you'll always feel you're not good enough. You're not deserving to be here on this earth. And the way people look at you still today is like that as well, unfortunately. So there's so much healing on so many different uh, levels required, but it's also from those who didn't see people as humans, who didn't see them as the older generations, who didn't see these people as human beings like everybody else, beyond race and gender and everything. So there's healing on so many different levels needed. To, to come to a point of equilibrium where you can now start moving forward, that you can now start moving. Do you see any signs that this is happening, at least attempts of healing? Is this already in the consciousness of people? I mean, I'm not sure if we are aware of that, you know, of our colonial past and what we did and still are considering Africa. Ah doesn't count, you know, sort of. Uh, uh, I, I'm wondering if you see a change in the mindset. As you know, uh, the whole world, <laughs> uh, do you meet attempts to, to repair that, at least acknowledge the, the bad things we did, even without maybe bad intention, just, you know. Yeah, it, it happened. You know, it happened. Yeah. I see... Um, it's very interesting when I, when I communicate with people from other parts of the world, um, I, I'd rather invite them to say like, you were, you were here, you saw what's, you know, what's here. And to look beyond, uh, it's not easy for people who's been in the center of it, but to look beyond it, because to now blame people doesn't help at all. Mm -hmm. It doesn't help at all. It's to take hands and to say, here we are now. 
we have such a big brain drain in South Africa, and it's from all ethnical parties. It's not only, um, yeah, it's from everybody. We have a big brain drain, especially now. Suddenly, a huge one. So people leaving the country. Mm-hmm. And it's professionals of all natures who's leaving. So they're trying to go elsewhere to go and find their, their, their joy, their delight, and feeling fulfilled or recognized at least. So that's happening on the one side. Inside the countries, there are pockets of mm-hmm. people uh, facilitating different types of things to, to, um, to just share a different perspective. And if I now have to look back, we're sitting here with you now, I only realize it now, what I've been doing the last decade was to try to, to share different perspectives and to put leaders for experiences rather telling them things, but putting them through experiences where they can feel it instead of me telling them something. And, and I'm not the only one. There are a lot of other people doing pockets of things just from a local perspective. Mm-hmm. But I think the internet also changed everything. It opened up the whole world for us, like me and you sitting here like this now. Mm-hmm. And I remember in the past, I would have been the only person on an online course or at, on a course. Like when I went to the U.S. to study spiral dynamics, I was the only one from Africa. <laughs> and the same happened for many other. I, I traveled over the world to do different courses. I was very fortunate to be able to do that. Then I'll be the only one from Africa. And I felt so lonely. <laughs> And then when I came back, I was so excited. I want to share all this stuff with other people. And I slowly realized <laughs> I need, I can't do it by myself. But I can, I can uh, arrange events and workshops, especially with leaders, to make them, to give them the opportunity to experience other possibilities. Really and good. that whatever they are, because when we are stuck in something, we can't see outside of it. Yeah. It's to give that cross-pollination and to arrange events where people from other parts of the world can can uh, but that we just have that interaction yeah so and that's, that's all possible in Dubai and it's happening it's happening yeah that's good and hopefully it will continue to happen because i find it's the only way i mean there are two things to say you are normally so caught in your own life that mm-hmm. you're you know the, the surroundings and you can extend it a little bit the circle of care but for us Europeans, also it, Italy is very near Africa, but still, you know, it's far away. So you don't really think about it and get concerned with it. Sometimes you hear something, but uh, you know, it doesn't enter. But when you be, go there and especially are shown the reality, you don't see only the tourist places, but also the mm-hmm. other places. We went to a, a, um, a village where there was no water and we, we mm. in the morning we went to get water from the well, you know, and that was quite distant. So to realize how people live, which is completely different than Westerners, you know, mm. and then we have this idea of, oh, they should save energy too and stuff like this. They don't even have it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I wanted to say this sort of unintentional arrogance which we have Mm -hmm. you can only hear when you go and see reality in your own country but also in the other far away countries and for me it was really eye-opening and i i'm so curious i still have this little bit when i was there you know this sort of afraidness oh can i walk through the streets is it uh, you know like i would have here in in the in big cities which i don't know you know so this is always this realization of how much you are have preconceived ideas preconceived also fears Mm -hmm. that you don't need to be uh, naive that you still have to to think about Mm -hmm. what what you are doing you know and then i noticed the which maybe is a typical german thing this feeling of a sort of guilt you know we, we, mm-hmm. After the war in Germany, we were sort of instilled with the guilt of, um, uh, of, of the, what the, our parents have done, or at least assisted in some way. And so knowing about how we treated people in Africa, 
or so I didn't, <laughs> you know, but, and my parents didn't, but there is still this a sort of, mm. you know, distance, distancing me in, in, I'm not, how you say, I'm not really free in, in communicating with black people because there's always this, I don't know, this insecurity, this, um, you know, I don't, I think you know what I mean. This, yes, um, I know. Yeah. So and we are the same. We are the yeah, same. I, I wanted to ask you, how is it to live as a white person and to be born a native, it's your country, uh, and live uh, there in a country which originally belonged to another uh, population? How is that? Well, what you just mentioned, uh, from the collective, uh, there's different levels to it in my experience. In my own personal experience, as a little girl already, I grew up in the countryside. And our media was so controlled, so we didn't know anything. We did, there was no internet, there was no television, mm -hmm. and we didn't grow up with those things. So we were completely removed from it in, in the countryside. But even as a young girl, I used to ask my mother, why is the lady who helps us in the house not work? How, why does she need to be out of the town at six o'clock in the evening? And then my mom said, yeah, but the, the, politicians, the politicians decided that. But it, it didn't make sense as a little girl. So already at then, I realized something big time is wrong here. Mm -hmm. In this picture, something is wrong. And then I came to study in Johannesburg. And I was alone. I had no family there. I, I went to study at another university there, my, my siblings. But I, I wanted to experience life outside of there. And I most probably, if I was born, if I was a bit, a bit younger, I would have been one of the activists. But <laughs> it, was, it was incredible. But from living here and what happened after 1994 is that same, that same projected guilt. I call it projected guilt. Mm -hmm. Because some of it is, yes, you didn't physically participate actively in it. And you would do anything in your power to change it if it was, you know, if you were in the position and if you had all the all the knowledge and information of what was really going on. And then your peers, you see some of them are the, they are the people who were doing these things. Like in the, the people who went to, uh, were in the police and in the army and the likes. So they were my same age, but they were pushed into something as well that they didn't want to do. They were, they were brainwashed and conditioned. And the terrible after effects of that in their Home, you know, in their lifestyles and in their families, of that because of that trauma, it was incredible trauma for them. They were 18 years old, and they were made to go and fight a war that didn't make any sense. And a lot of them died or got te terribly injured, like we see in Afghanistan and all the places too, with soldiers from the U.S. It was the same situation. So you had all these different dimensions of what was being done that was not humane didn't even make sense at all how somebody could even think that up. And then on the other side, you're part of that collective consciousness and the projected shame as well and guilt. And in my own experience, I truly believe that shame and guilt doesn't help anybody and complaining and blaming. But you're still part of that consciousness and you have to, from a business perspective, I would receive 500 notes a month when I start my own business because of who I am. Um, so I had that, uh, that type of oppression went the other way. And I was physical part of that to receive that because of what happened in the past, which I was not really responsible for, although my parents, they voted for whoever and the likes. So it's a very complex society. But what it did, I have to say to you, I don't see it as bad because what it did is it, we had to become very creative and resourceful of how we do things. And I think that's awesome because now you can create another reality and you can slowly empower people and give them the ability to also enact all these beautiful human abilities that's sitting in here, to be able to regain and reclaim their own power and their dignity to make it, to make a different, to co-create a different environment altogether. But it will take years. Like my daughter, she's turning 30 this year. Now with her, her generation didn't see that. They didn't see color and race 
they didn't grow they didn't grow up but some of them their their um idea was they were taking it on from their parents so you have these complex dimensions of people acting out of people um, intensely trying to do stuff differently and to get again that equilibrium that harmony between all these different types of energies and things going on and views but in the end i it, it always comes back for me to the human being that once they i've seen it many times in my professional career that once you that the fire is lit inside because it's only a fire that needs need to be relit and they feel it in their bodies what it really who they really are their whole perception everything changes and then they take it out it's like a ripple a, a, you put a drop of water in a in a lake and it goes out and that's been happening i think for the last decade that's been happening and technology is a big help because people now because of technology and the millenniums and the generation z's birthing into such an environment of technology and communications they can see what's happening in the rest of the world so they can open up their own perceptions and not only cling on to what their parents were conditioned to believe and what they were conditioned to believe as whether it's whatever it might, might have been so it's an interesting thing to live here because of all these dynamics so that when you travel it's fascinating because then you realize that when you come into a country when i was in spain for example to give you an example when i was working in spain I realize but we as South Africans don't have so much problems as we think we have because when I walked in Catalonia <laughs> people didn't even want to speak to me when I said I couldn't speak Spanish because they said they're not Spanish <laughs> it was incredible they didn't want to serve me in a restaurant because I said I'm a, I apologize I can't speak Spanish it was and then I realized but the problems that we thought and the discussions of very conscious people I would sit back and say to them <laughs> I feel good now because I've always thought we had so much problems in South Africa. But now I realize ours are not that old. Ours is maybe 100 or 200 years old. Yours is hundreds of years old. And then they would tell you the history. <laughs> <laughs> and then you realize that actually everything is about the context and the perception. And if you really go and look at it, then, then it's not so bad. Yeah, and that, <laughs> it, it, that's really amazing. So it, it, what I'm hearing is that you see in your country, people have begun to, to come together in some way, while what is happening in, in Spain at the moment is sort of refusing to recognize the value of the other person and to, to go back into a certain certain tribalism which is yes. uh, in war with another tribe and which you had before maybe but you are already overcoming it this is that's good news you know <laughs> and that's not about race in in spain it's no nothing. it's not about it's nothing it, yeah it's <laughs> not about race at all and, and i have many such uh, i had many such experience in traveling in some parts of the world and, but I want to just mention something that you said earlier about when you came here and you saw, you know, you didn't, people didn't have water. So how do you want them to look at electricity? Because they don't even have. But uh, many years ago, we went in the 2000s, we went uh, on a consulting trip into Zambia. And we wanted to go and sell a very expensive enterprise resource management system to the government. That's so a government management system. And it was incredible as that was my first entry into the country at that time. And as we were driving around, I said to my boss at the time, what are we doing here? Look around you. There's no waste rem removal in Lusaka. There was very little waste removal in Lusaka at the time. There, there were big holes in the roads. Basic things were not there. And now you want to bring in this 40 thousand a 40 million dollar deal to them to buy a system it doesn't make sense and then they did buy not from us they bought it from somebody else but then when i went back there again the mayor and i was very good friends at that time and i i coached him a little bit and i helped him through two um two elections and one day i rent, i was i had a rental car but a small little car 
And everybody said to me, you can't go on your own into the poorest parts of Lusak. But I said, I said, I want to go there. I want to see it. And they said, but the police don't even go in there. And not even any of the politicians would put a foot in there either. So, and then I said, just, I'll be fine. I'm always, I'm always safe wherever I go. <laughs> it doesn't matter. So here I go into the poorest of poor parts of Lusaka. There's no uh, roads. It's, it, it rains, so there's lots of water on the gravel roads. Um, women washing their clothes in the rainwater in the road. But what did I see that day? And it brought me back to Earth, like, very quickly. Because I was on a mission. I know I have to save Africa. <laughs> and as I was driving around, I saw happy people. Kids playing in the mud in the streets. They're living in shacks. But they're happy. And I would stop at some of the community leaders, and they would get into the car with me and go and show me things. And they were all happy. <laughs> so when I returned to my hotel, I called the mayor, and I said to him, I just had a complete paradigm shift. I'm not here to save Africa. They're teaching me stuff. These people are all happy. They might not live like we live in the Western world and what we are used to, but they are happy. What's more important? And that was a huge um, paradigm shift, but also a wake-up call. And a friend of mine who also did a lot of work in Africa, she always said to me, also said to me one day at that time, and she's a, she, her partner knew Lorraine, by the way. And he was the one who introduced me to Lorraine at the Da Vinci Institute. But she said to me as well, why do you think you have to go and do these things? What makes you think you are better than them? And it was such a come back down to earth to realize that other people in different parts of the world might live different and see the world different doesn't mean they're not okay. That is a completely affront to our mindset, who we think you need to have this, you have to have the other thing, and then we bring uh, the help to Africa so that it can grow. But you know, for quite a while, I have the suspicion that we try to open new markets, but we don't want to help the people. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I mean, that's uh, because if we would uh, realize that they don't need things which we think we need, that they might have skills of survival which we don't have anymore. And if something, something happens here and we don't have all the things we have, then oh, how can we survive? No? That they are much nearer to life, you know? And then we know that money doesn't make you happy. And I find it amazing that you had this example, lived example mm. of it, you know. But I have another so, one. You know, in terms of, of sharing different perspectives with, with leaders and people in big organizations, now I'm talking multinational, let's take the oil industry in West Africa. They had experience like that as well. And at this specific summit, there were only um, CEOs and CXO level executives at this, at this summit. It was a talent summit from the West African oil industry. And I was asked to be a keynote speaker and also to do a specialist presentation on how do you get your staff to think more creatively and innovatively. And I also did the emotional intelligence masterclass with them. In South Africa, I did the same, the same um, workshops I did here and talks and things like that. Just to give you that perception that they were much more open to what I was sharing and in the end, after three days, we were, me and the organizers were completely astonished because at the end of our summit, we always ask people to go in, we, we, we break them up in little groups and not people work together. So from other companies, so mobile and you have all those shell and all those type of people there. And now thinking of the level of people who were there with CEO level people that, so we break them up so they don't sit next to their friends. And then we ask them, what is the three things what are the three things that stood out for you during this conference? And I want to ask you, can you guess what number one was? Maybe the connection they had? No, no that they have to change their mindsets. Uh -huh. It was incredible. And then they came up with what they want to do to do that 
in their organizations. And as also, then they created their own little forum between them. And they will get together once in every how many months to see how they can inspire each other, where, where others have challenges doing this, where they need help from consultants and the likes. But I had never had that type of openness and participation, like real contributions from people ever in South Africa. Huh. It was like they were just ready for it and they were open. To, and like I said, are, these are people in the oil industry and they have major dilemmas, especially at that time, they had major dilemmas with the oil price and um, retaining good staff, you know, um, because of other parts in the world that would come and steal them. It was incredible that they came up with the things they came up with. And I had the same in Turkey as well, that they came up with such incredible, and it came out of them, we didn't tell them anything about that. They came up with it, and it was their experience. But they were open to it. Very good, very good. I think <clears throat> we all need um, more of these experiences to get you know, that was in the conference the first day, uh, the keynote speaker said, and I, I say it often in these interviews, uh, the worst thing which um, colonialism did in Africa was not so much to exploit the materials and everything, but to export a mindset. And that's exactly what, what you are saying. Our mindsets, we see the world completely different and that's also why we have climate uh, crisis or whatever, all these crises, because we see the world as a, a thing to exploit, as a, a, you know, and not as, a, as something to interact with. And, and it's getting to me ever more clearer how destructive and one-sidedness our uh, mindset is. I mean, you know, the right-hand quadrants, the, 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 the technology, that's all fine. Mm -hmm. But if we don't have the left-hand quadrants, if we don't have the, the interiority, if you don't respect people, if you don't allow them to be as they would like to be, but you make them desire things which they don't even need because you get money from this, this egocentrism, mm -hmm. you know, this, this creed. Mm -hmm. As long as we don't get a balance, I don't think any, you know, new solutions could uh, could do any any good, but be even more uh, part of the problem. So that's really, really so important to to change mindset. And you know, and in my personal experience, I was so astonished how much I was still in this, you know, in this normal mindset. <laughs> It's really a sort of an awakening when you when you really get close to the reality of other people, you know. So that's I do hope that instead of you know the kids protesting in Berlin, but take the airplane, although they don't take airplanes anymore, but take the airplanes and go into the reality of other countries and see how they live there. You know that would be good and plant there some trees or at home mm -hmm. some trees because I was very upset with this. Um, uh, uh, need to go and protest against climate change because for me it doesn't make any sense. I mean it's good raising a little bit of awareness but do something and that would be a good idea that the schools send their children to to live mm. three weeks in a village in in Africa no? mm. and participate in the life and then get a, get a reality uh, how do you say it? reality uh, check <laughs> yeah and also get it get it to a, a normal level that that's not like this you know but like yeah. coming to a, to a, yeah to what reality really is so now it's my little rant <laughs> <laughs> but you know you saying something you you say something very important there and that's something about living in africa especially south africa not so much the other countries and what we've seen through all the time, protest doesn't help anything. We have lots and lots of them, lots and lots of strikes, people strike. And I even wrote a blog about last year with all the climate change things happening. Because we had experienced it physically. People go on a strike, nothing changes. It still stays the same. Yes, you make awareness, uh, but it's also not real awareness. It's you're putting some, you, and it's raising guilt and shame, yes? 
but you don't show people how to get out of the guilt and the shame. There's no solution to it. You tell people you shouldn't fly, you shouldn't do this or shouldn't do that. It doesn't help them at all. They need to understand why. They need to understand their part in it. And with strikes, we had, we've got gazillions here, <laughs> lots and lots. Didn't change anything politically in the last 25 years, nothing. It didn't, it didn't improve people's lives at all. And we see it often because we have so many unions and the likes. And it, it, it creates chaos, temporary chaos, and then it's over. So we are sort of desensitized to these type of things anyway. So crime is for us a natural thing. For us, it's not something terrible because we, we grew up with it as part of life. But those type of things, for me, my question is, like you say, take people, let them experience something themselves to see, but it goes back to the connection again, the con real connection of nature and not learning about an apple as an object, but an apple as a living thing. There's an orchid waiting inside with all its seeds. And to take the whole cycle of the apple, how it lands on your table when you eat it. It's not just a, a, a word that you spell, A-P-P-L-E. It's a living thing. The tree is a living thing. Why should I live the way I do? And if I buy something, why should I be curious about what's in there? Where, how did it get to, to my table, on, into my house? So it's an integrated um, learning process, but it's real. It's a direct contact with the tree, with what peop how people live, where they don't have water, like you said, why they don't have water or electricity. And then you expect them to have fancy um, 21st century energy systems, which we don't have here. <laughs> I, I hope we will have them, but it's, it's not, you know, it will be a help in many problems, but it won't resolve the problem. The, the problem, problem is in the head uh, of, of, uh, of our idea of how life should be and what we would need because we think too much on the, on the external side. Mm -hmm. and unless we do the shadow work, first of all, we were talking about guilt and all these things. Mm -hmm. If that finally comes into the mindset of people that uh, we need to look what is really underneath all these things and my personal shadow and the collective shadow. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and that, that's a very, very, very important thing to, 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 to heal. You, you use the word heal. Mm -hmm. To heal these things first or at least at the same time. And we don't, we don't do that. We think we can do business as usual, just do, do, do. Mm -hmm. And the being part is undervalued, you know. And as we still undervalue women, for instance, um, also we, we undervalue ourselves in many ways. Uh, um, and we then go up and do like this uh, and try it. That, that's not the right way of appreciating what we are. So we are still there in, in, in a not natural way of, of being, like we undervalue people of other ethnicities and of other religions and things. Uh, we, 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 are, we, we need to do that, but not by somebody protesting or telling you, you have to do, otherwise you get punished. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. not the way. That's not the way. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't create change. Change comes from the inside out, not the outside. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have some more uh, lovely stories of this sort? <laughs> <laughs> I could talk for five days. <laughs> but you yeah, as I said, <laughs> I, but, I, but, I went, but, but I was, as I sit here with you now, going into being in a state, I just feel we, have, we are at such a beautiful place in the world right now where we can come together like, me, like you and me here now, that we, can, that we can explore these type of things and start connecting dots that we didn't do before. Yeah, that's and important. I think in, in our young people now, they live in a very visual world. And those abilities of conceptual thinking, for example, the whole system of thinking, I think if we start bringing those type of things into the world, a lot of things can improve and change dramatically. But we're still in silos. We still see things in separation. Like you see, we say, I come from here, and then I look at you, 
and but I don't see it. I'm part of the bigger picture. We're part of the same world. So I think that will that is going to um, they will be. For me, it feels like we're in a transition at the moment. We don't know yet where we're going, but there's a big transition happening of all sorts to shake us up and and uh, make us rethink and relook at life itself and our starting with ourselves and then more from community and organizational level and the way we look at politics and things like that. I think we are pushed into a situation where we need to now take, take a moment to pause to say what's really going on. Yeah. And like you say, then to heal all these different aspects of ourselves. Yeah, at least more people are doing that. Not, not really everybody, but you know. More people. It, it's it's needed a certain amount of people who are able to to do that and then get influence as you do with these courses. That's wonderful, you know. We need more of these things. And but you know, yeah, I want to share. I was, yeah, yeah. I, share, I want to share one last one with you, which because you raised it now, you you opened the door for that one. When we think in terms of humanity, just the possibility, of course, is that it would be eight billion people on the planet of what we more or less, whatever it might be, the exact number might be, doesn't matter. But people doing something to um, expand people's perception, to give different experience, more integral lifestyle, share more integral lifestyles, whatever it might be. We always have this perception now, we have to have equal amount of people that's now coming into a new type of awareness versus the others that's not there yet, whatever that might be. But then I'm thinking of Einstein. And I love this one, with this e, e equals mc square. If you go and make that from a physical point of view, it means that somebody who weighs about 87 kilograms has the energy capacity through their thoughts and their actions, the embodiment part, that's stronger than seven bombs that hit Hiroshima. <laughs> so if we just start to focus the the power of our minds, this way of other way of thinking and to really use our minds for a better purpose and our, our energy, our own physical energy and our emotional in intelligence, our spiritual intelligence, all our intelligences, we have that power, one individual. And likewise with the butterfly effect, which is a scientific proven effect, that the butterfly flaps its wings on that side of the, of the globe and it can cause a hurricane because it put uh, energy in motion. Yeah. So we don't need to be equal part. It's just we need to gain, uh, gain gravity in whoever is doing all these things to synthesize all this wisdom that we currently have in pockets all over the world. And then we, when we synthesize, there's so much power behind it. Yeah, and we don't even need to make a plan. Like no. the masculine way of doing is make a plan. This we have to do this and this and this, and then we arrive there and we arrive there and we need this. That's in itself. Yeah, it can, you can begin with this, but we need the feminine way of just going and seeing what we need and what comes up and and yes. allowing things to unfold, which in a masculine dominated world is still not. Everybody wants, we have to do this, and you have to do this, and you have to do this, as if they knew what will come out <laughs> if we do certain things. We don't know. We and don't we cannot know. say in 2050 the world will be uh, doomed because we are doing now. You, you don't know. How can you know? You have not enough knowledge. You, you need to understand the, the world, not only the earth, but the whole cosmos as a system. And mm. What do you know? Nothing. So when you interfere in a system and block it, you do even worse. What you need to do, and that is strangely, is a little bit like my work when I teach people singing. Uh, you have to take off the blockages so that the system can work by itself. And don't yes. try to interfere too much because then you will do the opposite of what your good intentions are. And the good intentions so often in our history have led to disaster. So we need to understand this, you know, that mm -hmm. the unfolding can be facilitated as you do with these people, for instance, but it cannot be 
direct it. So. No, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's interesting if you take that back to to our um, our beingness, mm -hmm. because it is the in the beingness the. And I, I, I always make this very interesting joke, especially when there's a lot of men around in the group. <laughs> I say to them, in terms of unfolding, because a lot of them cannot understand even the concept of unfolding and emerging, because they want they, they need to from masculine you need to go out and do stuff. Exactly. Yeah. And then I remind them of the the sperm. It takes a million sperms to fertilize one egg, one human egg. The egg knows the sperm is going to come because he's a million after her. <laughs> so she doesn't have to do anything. And that's where we are in the world right now. There are a million possibilities. We don't know, like you say, what's going to happen. But it's in that centeredness, state of groundedness, and taking care of myself first before I want to try to fix the whole world. We haven't, yeah. we, it didn't work. It never works. It never no. works. <laughs> no. The fixing thing, that is a masculine way of thinking, yeah. which we women have adopted too, you know, so it's not mm -hmm. that you can say women are different, they often mm -hmm. are not. But the thing is giving up fixing and staying with the unknown, that seems to be really difficult. Yeah, but you know, when I was in Zambia trying to save Africa, let's go back to that quickly. So when my friend said to me, what are you trying to do? Why are you doing it? I had to go and ask myself, what is this thing with you trying to save Africa? And then I went on a sabbatical after that because I wanted to know what's going on here that I can discover why, why, why was I doing that? And it, it took me back to my own birth. But it was very interesting then to, after that realize that what I want, what I'm doing, whatever I want to do in the future, is because it's an impulse, you know, it's, it's, it's I'm driven from my soul to do something, to share something with the world because I love it, or I'm curious about it, or whatever, but it's not because I need to fix somebody. And that changed everything. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And I still don't know what it is because, like you say, it's a complete unfold. Tomorrow it might be something very different that I do, but it's a complete unfoldment. Yeah, and this is so contrary to our mindset. And maybe now with all the coronavirus and all this stuff, maybe that is an admonition that we, we need to allow things to unfold instead of trying to control with mm -hmm. drastical means, you know, uh, whatever is happening uh, in good or bad or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, so that we give up the needing to have certainty and security, which is an illusion anyway, you know, when, mm -hmm. when you have absolute security, you have a wall around you, but then you are a prisoner yourself. So what, what, what use is it, you know, to mm -hmm. even this wall can crash and you, you <laughs> die underneath. So we have to give up this uh, attempt to direct life and to direct uh, the world. And this is really a difficult thing because we are so, we have lost the spiritual reconnection. And so we are fearing so much our own death that's creating panic collectively. And we are doing all sorts of things which, you know, are making death maybe even more probable, who knows? And we create these wars Still, the wars are somewhere else in the world and not in the Western world, but who knows, no? So we, we need to really change the mindset. And I'm, I'm so grateful that you have these examples in this lived experience to, to share with us. Oh, you're most welcome. I want to just, in, so when, as you're speaking about that now, what you remind me of is this very interesting South African man who, who is working with leaders and he works with big organizations. And I think Gies and Lorraine's paths most probably have crossed as well. But he's, very, he's a very curious, interesting man. And once he, and he wrote three books about leadership. And the one starts with intention. And I can't remember the second one. And then the third one is about leadership itself. But self leadership, it starts with self-leadership. But once he invited me to one of his workshops just to sit in. He wanted to just see my perspective on how other people react. And now, I just want to paint this picture for you. A, a, he, it's in a beautiful country club, a golf club, the, the venue. And the types of people who were there were all CEOs of investment banks and big banks and 
the likes. Those were the people that he invited. And he was dressed in khaki clothes. He comes from the farm. It was funny. <laughs> and they were all dressed up. And I was sitting in the front close, closest to him. So we had eye contact. So there was telepathy going on between us. But he did a very interesting when he started about the safety and security thing that you just spoke about. He started walking in the middle. It was a, it was a U shape, the tables. Mm -hmm. And he walked in the middle and he said to them, and it, it was directed to them, and he said to them, you think your beautiful mansion there in Santon is going to protect you? How? If, if there's an earthquake, how's the house down? The thing is going to fall apart. Um, your, all your boats and fancy vehicles that you have five garages for, how are they going to protect you when something happens like that? Okay. Oh, God. Your sense of safety is completely misaligned. But now I'm just witnessing this from the other side of the, of the U. <laughs> and I, I just smiled. They were all shocked. They were all shocked because nobody else before even made them consider that. And suddenly these guys, all earning huge salaries and owning all this stuff, which gave, and then he also went into the owning thing of, you think owning all your bank balance and owning all these things is making you important? Let's take all of that away and let's see who you are. But the way he was doing it, he was doing it very sarcastically. It's got a very interesting guy's sense of humor. But they were all shocked. I could see it took them quite some minutes to just uh, compose themselves. Because you could see the fear. You could see and smell the fear in that room. And then afterwards, during the break, he said to me, you did smell it, didn't you? I said, yes, I smelled the fear. So it was just very beautiful. It was most beautifully how he's done it then. And then the rest of the process that he took them through. To come back to the human part. That's beautiful. Yeah. It was most beautiful. I'm so grateful that he invited me. Um, you know, what? that's my conviction also. I think many people who we are sort of complaining about, they have no idea what they are doing. And if nobody yeah. tells them, and if somebody tells them in the right way, they, ah, oh, I didn't know, you know. That's uh, so my task a little bit is in a small circle to tell people what I see, you know, and I'm not very, you know, laughed for that often until somebody <laughs> <laughs> understands what I mean, you know, because often people cannot see so far. They are in their own, including ourselves, you know, but we have also other people who tell us, oh, maybe you are wrong here, no? And uh, so we have to do that too wherever we can and not fear and try to walk on eggshells because then they don't love me and uh, I will be alone. So that's, I think it's a challenge, but it's a life task. And I feel that for me. So that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and there's another one that I want to share with you. I think it's important to share that now because you now raised it again. You just triggered me again. And this mm -hmm. will be my last one. <laughs> Is that you... The way we, what I experienced, in my experience working with leaders specifically here in South Africa, was that we, we used to uh, host business breakfast workshops, like mini ones, like two hour ones. And it was not a sit in, it was like a finger breakfast. So the purpose was not the breakfast, it was the workshop. And initially we called it lead, uh, lead and lead with purpose mm -hmm. at that time. And leaders would, the CEOs and leaders of big organizations would, will come and, and every time they come, but we put them through experience rather than telling them stuff. So it's a creative process that they go through. We make them do all very interesting things. And then they discover these like, oh, we'll play with archetypes. Uh, and then they discover these things for themselves. And they kept on returning. And then once after six months, I asked them, but why are you coming back all the time? Take us into your organization now. And then they said to me, what you are doing is leadership awareness. It's not leadership development. You're making us aware of stuff through our own experiences when we play here with you. And our boards will most probably fire us because what you make us do. But you, you, nobody's taking care of us in this way. So they, they discover these insights of what's real, 
that how they see the world, how they see the organizations, how they see themselves, their lives, their people, the world, everything, their part in it through the process. So it's an experiment, it's experimental, you know, they, they do things that they saw that, that nobody else took care of them on that level and that they saw it as leadership awareness rather than leadership development. Then I, had to, then I went back to them as well and said, but what about all these leadership academies that you have all over the world now? Lots and lots of them and business schools and the likes. They said, but that's people trying to teach us how to lead and what to lead, not who our awareness. I don't work with our awareness. So it always comes back to the awareness part first before the development part. So my question in this case is, did they bring it somehow into, the, uh, into their enterprises? Because that they would be the bridge to, the, to define. To the people, yeah. yeah. But some of them did take me into their organization to do some similar work with some of their, especially their executive teams. And some of them came back to say, that I'm, the one with, they would, the one would you know, uh, take notes all the time because he wanted to, to, to copy the same process with these people. And I said, you can do it, it's perfect. Because he just wanted to wake them up to some of the, some of the ways they they saw things like leading from the heart and uh, creative innovation, for example, and things like that. And we also had one about the art of relating in the twenty first century, how we relate to each other in the workplace. Yeah. So and, the, and then they took it into their organisations on some level. But yes. but I always knew there needed to be some a lot more to really anchor it. But at least it was yes. a start. It's a start and hopefully we will continue somehow, thanks to you and to so many other people who are not noisy, who don't go on the streets and shout, but they are doing the work and that's why we don't see it. But I think it's going on quite a lot already all over the world, the silent workers on development <laughs> of humankind. <laughs> So thank you very much, Hanemi. Oh, thank uh, you so much. Yeah, our so viewers, um, enjoy it too. Do you have a um, website or something to share? Yeah, you can find me on www.joygeneration.world. And we're busy with a new website that will be up uh, in the next month or so, which is www.sensemakinggap.com. Wonderful. I will publish it on the on the page which I create for this. Thank uh, you very much. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day.